My name is Pastor Drema, and I'm not Andy, <laughs> as you see on your outlines. Uh, I'm one of those pastors that mainly in the background doing a lot of other stuff that uh, we don't speak of. <laughs> no, we're actually, but uh, you may not know a lot about me, but one thing I'm going to tell you tonight is that I love musicals. How many love musicals here? Okay, good, good. Musicals are a great, great thing. Uh, if you uh, think about it, you have this, this person singing and his this melodious voice and then you have the other person. What intrigues me is the other person. The other person has to have a expression resulting. They can't, they can't vocalize. They have to have the expression. So you look at it and you say, uh, are they sad? Or are they annoyed or appreciative of the song? You know, maybe the guy's breath is too much or something. Uh, or... Uh, are they unforgiving? You know, maybe the guy did something wrong and he's asking forgiveness by song and she's going, no. You know, what are, what's, what's happening? You know, when I think about it, it kind of goes along with our uh, worship series, believe it or not. And, <laughs> wait, there's a way, there's an end to this. Uh, if you think about it, we sometimes, uh, the scenario is close just with our experience in corporate worship. Each week at church, we stand and we sing or we sit and, si and sing to God. He's the one being sung to, okay? And in each, each of us then project onto God what we think he's feeling, we, what we think his facial expressions are. Well, is he completely enraptured by our worship or is he kind of bored? Uh, is he excited like uh, a parent when the child comes and says, look at this. Or is he one of those fathers that is hard to relate to, that's uh, unpleasable, nothing you can do uh, satisfies him? You see, the truth is, what we project onto God really affects how we worship, okay? And how we sing affects how we feel about worship. Uh, in worship, both you and God are the actors, where uh, the, the singers are, are the vocalists, and then one is passive, but God is not passive, not at all. He's very involved in what his children are going through. So today, today, we're going to briefly talk about the four feelings that get affected through great worship. And then we'll spend time in worship afterwards. First, we're going to look tonight at what great worship feels like and how worship interacts in our own situations and needs as we go through life. But first, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come into your sanctuary. And Father, we ask you, your Holy Spirit, to come, to blanket over us, and to help us to really, truly worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Point number one, what happens when we worship? First, God envisions me when I get discouraged. Now, we can see this in Psalm 73, if you have on your outline. The psalm was written by... Uh, Asaph, one of the David's uh, directors, musical composer. And in the first 15 verses, boy, he goes through a mess of stuff. He's really in a mental funk. Uh, he, the verses describe a person who's discouraged by the injustices of the world. Uh, he, they describe the human struggle such as, uh, you know, with envy and strife. Wishing we had another person's job or marriage. I like their marriage. Or their personality. Or maybe we wish we had another person's waistline. Or somebody's hairline. Or maybe the bottom line. Uh, the first three or 15 verses describe the human struggle with pride and selfishness and ambition and arrogance. Like s accepting bribes or kickbacks. How discouraging it is to be trapped in those then we can get cynical of the unfairness of life and the human condition. We can get confused and discouraged and bitter and envious, unhappy, far from God, double-minded, tossed back and forwards. Does that sound like us? At the end of the 15 verses, the writer is completely frustrated, but then he experiences a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Verses 16 and 17, he says this. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived therein. He says, I was discouraged and ready to give up. 
until I came into the sanctuary of God, the rest of God. Until I practiced the discipline of the assembly of people to God's people together, there wasn't a happy bone in my body. And then he says he was being pulled down by all the carnal thoughts. And he came into the sanctuary of God and he began to change. God is so awesome. I don't know if you know that or not. God is awesome, right? Amen. When we worship, something happens. When we worship, hearts get full of joy. And God re-envisions us to see what life is really important in life. Even arrogant people like me get humble before God's greatness. He says in verse 21 and 22, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in the heart, my, I was stupid and arrogant. Well, he doesn't pull any punches, does he? I was like a brute beast toward you. He was saying he was self-destructive. He was saying here that when I don't worship, I re when I refuse to enter into worship, other things happen with my mind. And I don't make the best decisions. When I ignore my soul, I tend to gravitate to those less noble ideas. I become anxious about tomorrow. I envy people who have what I don't. I develop a sense of entitlement that says, hey, I deserve this. And it chokes off my gratitude. I become negative and judgmental towards other people. I get discouraged and easily defeated by setbacks. Now that's the non-worshipping mind. But the psalmist said that through worship, we can experience a touch of God's love and that overwhelms our heart. From this point on, in this psalm, he no longer talks about God, but he talks directly to God. He says, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my hand. And you can picture a father holding a child's hand holding on to me, never letting go. He says, you guide me with your counsel. In other words, you keep me from making stupid mistakes, right? And afterwards, you will receive me with honor. Whom have I on, in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So the psalmist says, through worship, my heart was changed and envisioned. Okay? Uh, can you imagine what he would say if he hadn't gone into the sanctuary? What if I had avoided worship? What if I neglected the assembly? What would have happened? Well, I would have, been, I would have continued to be discouraged by my circumstances. It's just sitting right in the middle of them. I would have gone on in bitterness and envy. I would have made stupid decisions. I would have lived an ungrateful heart. I would have been set up for sinful behavior. I would have spoken toxic words, words that they go out of your mouth and if you look in a cartoon phase, they look green and they fall on these people and they're toxic and you can't take them back. I would have lived blind to the reality of God. Thank God for his sanctuary. You can hear him say, thank God for the discipline and, and the blessing of worship. So when we worship, God envisions us and we are in this, when we are discouraged. Second, your second point, God renews me when I am hurt or wrong. Now turn over in Acts 16 and while you're doing that, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. When you're wrong or when you're hurt, where do your thoughts tend to go? I know with... <laughs> You think about it, huh? I know with mine, uh, I said, uh, I try to convince myself that, well, this is a bad person and focus on their flaws. Well, she's fat anyway. Maybe I even try to get even. You might be thinking, well, Dreama, that's not a very Christ like way of doing things. But that's really what we're thinking, right? So in Acts 16, we read about two guys who had. Awful stuff happened to them. Paul and Silas, they were preaching about Jesus in Philippi, and they are having miracles upon miracles happen. And one of the great works of God was uh, delivering a slave girl from an evil spirit. And you would think that everybody would say, oh, wonderful, that is great. But the owners of this slave girl got pretty ticked. 
They said, wait a minute, that's our bread and butter. We can't, we can't do that. So they got mad, they got angry. They're con artists. So they, they uh, in Acts 16 we read uh, that they had uh, the, the uh, political people get them and throw them in jail. It says, in verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Ouch. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Now, let's pause a moment. How would you react? Me, I'd be screaming bloody murder. Get me out of here. Unjustice, unfair. You know, life's not fair. You're not fair. So... The result is you're attacked. You know, first of all, you say, well, I'm going to sacrifice my life for God. I'm going to live a righteous life. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to do all this. And as a result, you're attacked. You're flogged. You're treated unfairly, judged unfairly, and thrown into jail. Now, look at this verse. This is amazing. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas, and remember they're bloodied and beaten and bruised. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And then as a little side note, it says, uh, and the prisoners were listening. You know, like they had a choice. They were a captive audience. Um, there were no other channels, right? They had to listen to them. So in verse 26, suddenly it says there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And all at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains full, fell off. Now when you worship God, Marvelous things happen. And very often in scripture you'll find that a great outpouring of the power of God happens when you worship. Very often. In this case, it was a timely earthquake that allowed the prisoners the opportunity to escape. So now the jailer's ready to kill himself because he says, oh man, they're going to kill me. I may as well do it myself. And Paul could have said, well, maybe you'll think next time before you start beating up on Christians. Instead, because he had worshipped, because he had prayed, because he had sung to God, his heart was tender and compassionate, and he was ready to share his faith, and he was ready to welcome this man, this jailer, into the family of God as his brother. Now you see, through worship, God renews us when we're wronged, this week, somebody is going to get hurt some way by somebody. It's going to happen. So I'm asking you now, will you enter the sanctuary? You will you say, God, I'm not going to respond to this by anger like a brute beast, like the psalmist said. I'm going to acknowledge that you are my Lord, not my anger. Some of you might have a fresh wound. Something happened this week to you. Maybe you're just thoroughly, thoroughly disgusted, thoroughly depressed, feeling totally alone. You may have been hurt by somebody. Now, as we worship, would you be willing to uh, go to God and ask for help? He's there for us. You, will you pr be able to pray? It says, I affirm that you are Lord, that you are my Lord, even over hurtful circumstances. And I will worship you and let God renew my spirit. Great worship and visions is when God envisions me when I discourage and renews me when I'm hurtful or hurt or wronged. Third, when I worship, God gives me hope when I'm disappointed. Now, how does your mind run when you're disappointed? Uh, because a lot of times things don't turn out the way we want them to. In my thoughts, uh, I have to confess, I go on a pity party. You know, pity pot, whatever you call it. I don't know how they, how they say it here. You know, poor me, I want to eat some worms. Why does this happen to me? It, life's not fair. And I often give in to it. I start to feel sorry for myself and view myself as a victim and forget many, God, many of God's gifts to me unless 
I enter the sanctuary. Are you realizing now that that's a cool place to be? Let's go to Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Uh, he's one of the, ma the minor prophets toward the end of the Old Testament. And this is one of the most beautiful passages. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Uh, so you'll see a remarkable entrance into the sanctuary here. Uh, this is what Habakkuk says at the end of his prophetic words when he views de devastation all around him. Nothing turning out right. Verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. And you may be thinking, well, so what? But this is an agricultural society that he's writing to. So there is no food. There is no livelihood. There's no point. Everything's gone. It's, it's total hopelessness. Though the fig tree does not bud, no grapes on the vine, the olive crop fails, and the field produces no food, no sheep, no cattle. Now this is what's so magnificent. Verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God, my Savior. My sovereign Lord is my strength. It's not the produce. It's not the flocks. It's not portfolios, not financial assets. Not power, not popularity. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Now, maybe some of you this week have been put to the ringer. You've uh, experienced great disappointment. People have let you down. Your finances took a beating. You just had a crummy week. You're frustrated. You're disappointed. What are you going to do? Now, of course, there's a time for grieving over loss and pain. The writers of Ecclesiastes says that. There's a time to mourn. But there's also a time, ladies and gentlemen, and I want you to get this if you don't get anything else, for this, this defiant spirit of worship to come out and says that no circumstances in the world can try to separate me from the love of God that is mine in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So you've got to figure out, how would a back scripture be written for you? How would you write it out? And this is what, you know, though, he says, though the crops fail. What about, though my mate doesn't treat me with love, with love and respect I deserve, I'll practice forgiveness and love. Though my doctors have given me a bad report, I'll continue to trust my body and soul to Christ. Though I'm unemployed, though I'm divorced, though relationships uh, disappoint me, though I didn't get the parents or the spouse or the children that I wanted or I'd hoped for, though I have cancer, nevertheless, I will rejoice in the Lord. I love that word, nevertheless. In spite of the circumstances, God is... The Lord is my strength. Today, if you're disappointed, will you enter the sanctuary and let God give you a hope for a new future, a promise? Because great worship is when we meet God in the midst of great disappointments. Now lastly, number four, God gives me boldness when I struggle with fear. And this is, I have to tell you, this is my my weakness here. When I'm afraid, I can be tempted to give up. When I'm facing a scary scenario, I'm tempted to give in to avoidance or take the easy way out, try to escape, run. But when I enter the sanctuary, God gives me a new strength and a new boldness. Now let's look at uh, Second Chronicles. Uh, turn back, if you would, to Second Chronicles 20. It's a story of Judah and King Jehoshaphat, yes, that is a word, and it's, he's real. <laughs> he's a king, and God's enemies are up against his land. Uh, they have a vast army, and they're facing, you know, all the nations are around them, surrounding them. And Jehoshaphat says, Jehoshaphat was resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. Now, you drop down to verse 12, and it says, Our God, now that's Jehoshaphat praying now. This is the king. 
Our God, will you not judge them? He's talking about the enemies. For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and their children and their little ones, they stood there before the Lord, standing. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazreel, and a son of Zechariah, and it said, the word of the Lord says this, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord that he will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. That's a promise. The Lord will be with you. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Jehoshaphat bowed down his fa with his face to the ground, and all the Jew people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korathites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Now look at verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out in the army, head of the army and saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing in praise, God set up ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. And they were defeated. God gave them the victory. They faced insurmountable odds they were filled with fear. They sought the Lord. God said, praise me. Give me worship. And in place of fear, he gave them a boldness to worship him. Now picture the scene. Jehoshaphat sends out the, the, the team before the army, but it's not warriors. It's worshipers. And I don't know what kind of music they were singing that... Uh, Imagine them singing, this is amazing grace, you know, and, and going on down the, just kind of hopping down the road here and all of them praising the Lord, tambourines going. They were just expressing joy. In the midst of opposition and fear, they entered the sanctuary and they worshiped and they praised God and the world looked different to them. They realized that God is much bigger than their problems. Now, Today, some of us are facing in our natural eyes um, very scary situations. Some of you are fearful and rightfully so. I'm going to invite you to go to come into the sanctuary to worship God and let him fill you with boldness. You know, the psalmist went to the sanctuary even when the wicked was still prospering. And while he was tempted to give in to envy, and greed and unforgiveness and anger. He went in and worshiped and everything changed. Paul and Silas worshiped before the earthquake happened. And they, while they were in prison. And they were able to forgive the, the one who beat them and imprisoned them. Habakkuk praised God even when everything was barren. And the Israelites advanced and praised while the enemy was still coming. In every case, worship was, as it always is, a discipline, an act of faith, a statement of trust. And now it's up to us. Now it's our day. Now it's our turn. You're going to be disappointed like the psalmist. You're going to be hurting or hurt like Paul and Silas. You're going to be disappointed like Habakkuk. And you're going to be afraid like Jehoshaphat. There are going to be times that's going to happen. Now you can live in discouragement and hurt and disappointment and fear. You can live in a non-worshipping mind. Or you can enter into the sanctuary and worship this great God. And discover fresh what worship really is. Bow your heads with me in prayer. There may be some of you here who don't know how 
to go into the sanctuary because you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior. That's so easy. God, our Jesus, wants to have you in that sanctuary with him. You just say, uh, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be the leader of my life. And he will. And then you can say with the rest of us, thank you, Lord, for your sanctuary. Thank you that we can come and worship you and not be afraid. Help us to enter into your sanctuary and give you our sorrows, our hurts, our disappointments. Help us to know that when we lay these down, you give us joy and peace and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.